lecture. This is part of our, our new weekly series. My name is Birigupad Das, and I'm very happy to, to be the one giving the lecture for this week. I hope it will be useful or, or fun or entertaining, or, or in some way, it will give you something. The title for today's lecture is Towards an Understanding of the Difficult Parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam. This will not be a very long lecture. Rather, I will uh, speak for some time and then maybe we can discuss. Maybe there can be some questions and, and uh, perhaps some answers as well. We will see. But I'm very happy to see all of you. Nandavat again, Kali Yuga Pavana Prabhu. Nandavat Gayatri. Nandavat Govinda Mohini. Nandavat Mahamantra. Dandavat Shamananda, Sakirati, and Dandavat Saragrahi, last but certainly not least. Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Yuta Padakamanam Sri Guru Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sarivam Svadvaitam Savadutam Varijana Sahitam Krishna Jaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakhan Vitamstra Vagyana Timirandasya Dhyanangana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Guravena Maha Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Langhayate Grim Yat Kripata Mahambande Sri Gurum Di Natarinam Manchakal Patarubyascha Kripas Indubyaevacha Patitanam Pavanibyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Namo Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prima Pradayati Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namne Gauratvishe Namaha He Krishna Kuruna Sindhu Dina Bandho Jagatvati Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastuti Jaitam Surato Pangur Mamamanda Matirgati Matsarvas Papadambojo Radha Madaramohanu Diviad Vrindaranya Kalpadrumada, Sri Madhat Nagara Singha Sanasto, Sri Sri Radha Sri Lagovinda Devo Krishta Levi Sevimanam Smarami, Sri Manrasara Sarambhi, Vang Shiva Tattatastita, Karshan Venus Vanair Gopir Gopinatha Sri Istana, Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi, Radhe Vrindavanishwari, Vrishabhanu Sute Devi, Pranamami Haripri, Vrindaya Itulas Deviai, Priyaya Ike Shavasita, Krishna Makti Prade Devi Satyavatya Namuna Maha, Panchatatvatmakam Krishna, Bhakta Rupa Swarupakam, Bhakta Avatara Bhakta Kyam Namami Bhakta Shaktikam, Jayashri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sri Shigaura Bhakta Vinda, Hare Krishna Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Eva Kevalam. Kalao Nasti, Eva Nasti, Eva Nasti, Eva Gatiranyata. So again, welcome everyone. Welcome Krishna Kumari and, and Bhakti Rasa, who have joined since I greeted the rest of you. Srimad Bhagavatam was the topic of my last speech as well. Nice that you put on the video, Gayatri. I can see you as well. Srimad Bhagavatam was the topic of my last speech. Uh, and I thought to continue today. I know this is not a series like the previous Tatva Viveka classes, but there's so many things to be said about the Srimad Bhagavatam. Last time, I focused on the glories of the Srimad Bhagavatam how the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, is a sun for the age of Kali. For us people who are blinded by the darkness of Kali, for those whose eyesight has been taken away by the age of Kali, the sun of the Srimad Bhagavatam has arisen. I spoke also about how the different uh, skandhas or the different cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam represent 
various limbs of the whole form of Sri Krishna. So last lecture was focused very much on the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam. That does not mean that today I'm going to speak about the demerits or the, the bad things of the Srimad Bhagavatam, but I'm going to focus on our demerits in understanding the Srimad Bhagavatam, challenges in understanding the Srimad Bhagavatam. Because we may hear many things about the Bhagavatam. It's a wonderful book and it's one of my top five books and you should read it and so on. But the fact is that the Srimad Bhagavatam is quite a challenging book to read. Uh, I come across these kind of challenges quite often when I speak to people, not explicitly always about the Srimad Bhagavatam, even Bhagavad Gita, uh, which still is a fairly, quite a bit easier book than the Srimad Bhagavatam, but even the Bhagavad Gita can be extremely challenging for a modern person to read. And there are many reasons for this. One is, of course, language. Even if the text is translated into English, like Prabhupada's translation, for example, still there are plenty of Sanskrit words in the text. There's guna, there's lila, there is so many different Sanskrit words. And in the beginning, it's difficult to keep track of all of this. This is a difficulty that those of us who have studied these texts for a longer time may not always realize how difficult this can be to a new reader. When every 10th word, when you don't understand every 10th word, it makes for a frustrating reading. It doesn't even have to be Sanskrit words. There are plenty of unfamiliar English words in the Srimad Bhagavatam before you kind of get used to it and get to the stage when you take these words for granted. Words like transcendental, or opulent, or cause of all causes. These kind of phrases, they may not mean very much. So there are plenty of difficult words. But even more difficult than that for many readers is how many names there are. I was just today giving another class on, on the Bhagavad Gita to another audience, and it's very often to find people who start reading the Bhagavad Gita and they never get past the first chapter because there are so many names. If you do get past the first chapter of the Gita, you'll realize that all these names don't really matter because you'll never hear about Chekitana or Satyaki or Kuntiboja or all of these kings that you hear about in the first chapter. They're just there for the background. But you don't realize that when you're first reading it. You feel like you're dropped into a Russian novel with 100 different characters, everybody having uh, several different names, Alexander, is Sasha, and so forth. So you get lost in this jungle of names. And quite often I find that devotees, uh, they don't know what to do. They feel like everybody else is understanding everything. I'm the only one who's stupid in this group. And then they give up. Maybe they'll go on saying that, yeah, I'm reading the Srimad Bhagavatam. But they don't actually do it. I was speaking to one devotee who was reading the first canto for two years. And didn't get to the end of it. This devotee actually read the first couple of chapters and then after that just kept the book on uh, the night table. But it was basically just gathering dust. But at the same time, the devotee could say that I'm reading the Srimad Bhagavatam because it's there by the bed. So that devotee never made a conscious decision not to read it. It just happened so difficult so instead that devotee read some smaller books and something else so how to deal with these difficulties the difficulty of words and names those are some of the things i want to speak about today unfortunately there are other difficulties as well and one difficulty of course is with the format of Prabhupada's books or maybe almost all 
translated shastras. And that format is a format of focusing on each verse individually. Each verse is first presented in Devanagari. Uh, then you have transliteration, then word by word translation, then the translation of the verse, and then quite often a very extensive commentary or purport. All of this is extremely useful. We just had Sri Padmana Maharaj here in Finland, here in Sri Chaitanya Dham, where I am in the countryside. And he was giving these uh, uh, lectures on the Brahma Stuti where he was literally going through every single word separately. And he was even uh, kind of uh, uh, checking with us, Shamananda, what does Amrita mean like this? That was very useful. I'm sure all of us learned many things. But if you read in such kind of close, with such close attention to detail, you won't get more than maybe one or two or five verses a day, with the result that uh, when you finished the verses of the day, you'll not remember anymore what happened yesterday or the day before that. You're just focusing on one bit of the whole puzzle at a time and losing track of the whole picture. This is a difficulty I come across quite often. But all of these difficulties so far have been technical difficulties. The difficulty with words, the difficulty with names, the difficulty with the format of, of individual verses and purports. But we also have some uh, difficulties in terms of content. There are some parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam that are extremely difficult to understand. Perhaps the most famous example of that is the description of the universe in the fifth canto, where it seems like Earth is presented as a flat disk with these circular oceans, the innermost being an ocean of salt water. Then you get oceans, further oceans that are like rings like this, with ring-formed islands. And you get oceans of milk and curd and alcohol and sugar water. And as a reader, you can't feel anything else than bewilderment. Where do I find an ocean of milk? How would an ocean of milk even work? Are they changing the milk every second day or does it curdle and start stink? And how does it really work? Or the ocean of wine, the ocean of alcohol, is everybody like, completely wasted around it or what's the system let alone how to kind of understand that in relation to earthly geography or or the geography and the astronomy that we've learned in school and that we can see in media and so forth but there are also many other difficult parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, another famous example is in the 10th canto in the description of Dvaraka. King Ugrasena, who is the, the king of Dvaraka, he has something like uh, 10 billion lifeguards. Now, 10 billion is more than there are people on earth at the present moment. So how could one king have so many guards? just doesn't make any sense. How could you even fit all of them in Dvaraka, even if they were standing like next, shoulder to shoulder like that? So there are difficulties like this as well <coughs> in the Bhagavatam. So when you have a book which is so difficult like this, wouldn't it be easier to just kind of take the book, show our pranam to it, and put it aside and focus on Eckhart Tolle or, or something else would be more kind of up-to-date and easier to understand. That is one alternative, of course. Maybe not Eckhart Tolle, but, but the books of, of Guru Maharaj and other uh, Vaishnavas of the present generation. And that's usually a good thing to do, 
to to read the the new and up to date texts but i do think that we should also challenge us challenge ourselves with these difficult texts because uh, i think that the main merit of any text is when the text challenges us when we read a text where we agree with everything, where we understand everything and agree with everything, nothing really happens. Nothing really happens. Either we just don't understand the text, or then when we agree with everything, we stay the same. The text just reinforces our previous uh, conditioned understanding of the world. We don't grow. The best texts are the texts that uh, challenge us and make us, force us to think about things in new ways. Maybe we will not understand everything. Maybe we will not even agree with everything. And this may be kind of a forbidden thing to say. Don't tell Guru Maharaj or Padmanam Maharaj anybody or anyone like this, but Maybe we don't even have to agree with everything in the Srimad Bhagavatam, at least right now. But based on the kind of glories of the Srimad Bhagavatam that I spoke about last time, I think we should show enough respect to the Srimad Bhagavatam that we realize that this is a book that may be a little bit too difficult for me at the moment. And now I'm not speaking about any one person in this group, but all of us. This is a book that is more advanced than any of us. I mentioned last time that the Srimad Bhagavatam is always said, is often said to be the touchstone of a pundit. You're a real pundit if you can explain the Srimad Bhagavatam. And we may not be on that level. I, for, for, for one, am not. So the Srimad Bhagavatam is a text that is going to challenge all of us. But by doing that, it's going to force us to go deeper in our understanding of what Krishna consciousness really means. So I do think that it's worthwhile to, to give this text uh, some effort. If we are not reading the Srimad Bhagavatam at this moment, we should start. If you're not having the Srimad Bhagavatam in your reading schedule right now, start reading it. Next week? No. Today. Today. Because this is by far the most important text that we have in our whole Sampradaya. All of the, the theology of the Goswamis is built on the Srimad Bhagavatam. So I think we should uh, put some effort into it. And all of these difficulties that I've just described to you and that uh, hopefully didn't uh, make you too depressed all of those difficulties can be overcome and it's not even very difficult to do so so let's start from the beginning the difficulty with the difficult words whether it is english or spanish or swedish or whatever language you're reading it in uh, gayatri what would you suggest how to overcome that difficulty The difficulty of reading it, what do you mean in our, our own language or just to read it in general? No, the difficulty with uh, that with the uh, in our own language, uh, the language containing difficult words. Mm. Well, to look up words as we go along to, to get a proper understanding of what they mean. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, that's I that's that's the simple answer, I think. Uh, to look up the words, like when you come across a word you haven't done, you don't don't understand. I just and this happens to all of us all the time. I came across the word umbelliform yesterday. Umbelliform, an umbelliform head. It means a head which is like this looks a little bit like a an upside down umbrella. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the context, but. In one Shasta, there's a description of, of people who have umbelliform uh, heads. So I learned that new word. 
Uh, and this will happen to all of us all the time. We learn new words. And one practical tip is when you come across a strange word, is to write it up. Have a Bhagavatam reading notebook. Sargra is really good with notebooks, but that we can all of, us, all of us learn from that. Have a Bhagavatam reading notebook and write up the name, the, the word. Transcendental, something which is beyond our senses, something which is beyond the ordinary world. Yeah. And the second difficulty, the difficulty with names, that can be solved in the same way. But here the difficulty is a bit larger because the Srimad Bhagavatam is shock full of names. And not all the names are as important. Suta Goswami, Shukadeva, Parikshit. Uh, these are persons that we will encounter all the time. And we'll quickly lose track of what's going on in the Srimad Bhagavatam if we forget who they are. But there are many other persons who are not so important. King uh, Ajamidha, or, or so many other persons mentioned in these kind of dynastic lists, for example, in the ninth canto. Uh, if you'd make a list of all the different names, who is who in the Srimad Bhagavatam, you'll end up with another book, like a book of 100 pages or so. That's not very practical to learn all of those. Who is King Avir, or who is the sage Avirhotra? He's one of the, the nine Yogendras. That's enough. You don't need to know more about him. But uh, as a new reader, it's difficult to know, is this character who is introduced here, is this somebody that I should kind of get to know? Or is it somebody who's just mentioned once? But here we have a very good help in Prabhupada's purports. Especially in the first canto. Prabhupada's purports in the first canto, they're a little bit different than the purports for the other cantos. This is because Prabhupada wrote the first canto in a different way. The first canto was written by Prabhupada when he was still in India. And in contrast to the later cantos, at least from the third forward, maybe even from the second, it was actually written. You probably know that Prabhupada, uh, later on, he dictated his texts. Uh, and there's a difference here. When you dictate, it's more kind of spontaneous. It's more kind of your feelings. And Prabhupada often used to say that his purports are like his emotional ecstasies. But in the first canto, they don't function exactly in the same way. In the first canto, he's writing the text. So he's putting more kind of systematic thought into the text. And one of the ways in which this comes out is that in the first canto, when a new person is mentioned, Prabhupada often has a small section about that person in the, in the purport. Narada. Narada is blah, 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 blah. So those persons that uh, are described in the purports in this way, these are usually people that it's worth to, to uh, put behind your ear, so to speak. These are going to be important persons. Nevertheless, this is going to remain a challenge. And I think this is a challenge that uh, many of us will continue being faced with, even after years of reading uh, the Bhakti Shastras, there are so many names. And of course, it gets worse by the Indian style of not using one name for one person. Like uh, if Gayatri were a person in ancient India, she wouldn't just be Gayatri Dasi, she would be uh, uh, um, Padma, Nayani, uh, Sumadhyama, uh, all these different kind of descriptive names, and maybe also the name of her father, like a father's daughter, her brother's sister, and so on. So there would be like 10 different names for one person instead of just Gayatri. And this, of course, can make it difficult for us because we, once we finally understood who is Parikshit, then suddenly he's, known, he's called by another name. 
then it seems like it's some new person. But again, Prabhupada usually helps with things like this. Uh, in the purport or in the translation, quite often he simplifies, even if Parikshit is, is mentioned in the verse using another name in the translation, Prabhupada will put Parikshit. So uh, we shouldn't overlook the importance of Prabhupada's purports. Prabhupada's purports are extremely helpful for uh, the reader, not only for the novice reader, but also for others, because of course, Prabhupada often goes into great uh, effort in explaining theological, difficult theological points, technical theological points. But again, I think the best help for this problem with the names is uh, uh, to write up the more important names and write maybe a short description, Parikshit, King, who was cursed to die in seven days, speaks with Shukadeva Goswami, the Bhagavata, something like that. That probably would be quite enough. Uh, it's also useful to try to keep track of the different levels of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Because the Srimad Bhagavatam is not just a long book. It's also an extremely multi-layered text. This is not unique for the Srimad Bhagavatam. Many Sanskrit texts work in the same way, that you have a, a main narration, which in the case of the Srimad Bhagavatam, is the discussion between Sutta and the sages headed by Shaunaka in Naimi Sharanya. And Sutta is then telling about Parikshit and Shukadev. And Shukadev, who is speaking to Parikshit, is telling stories about Narada, Vyas, uh, about uh, um, Yudhishthira, Maitreya, Vidura, and so on. So it's like Story within story within story within story. Sometimes in some places there's seven layers. Sutta and Shaunaka, Shukadeva and Parikshit, Maitre and Vidura, uh, somebody else, somebody else, seven different layers. So if you get lost sometimes, <laughs> there's no, no wonder. But again, the purports can help us, and it can also help us to, to reread the text. And I think this is uh, perhaps the most important way to understand the Bhagavatam, despite all of these difficulties, to give it time and give it effort, to give it regular reading. Uh, Prabhupada very much liked to quote a verse from the first canto, uh, Nashta Prayishva Bhadrishu. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. The, the first two lines here, they speak about uh, that uh, uh, almost all the, the, the uh, impurities of the heart are destroyed by regular service of the Bhagavatam. Service of the Bhagavatam, of course, means service of the book Bhagavata through reading and hearing and the person Bhagavata. So regular reading is really important and, and will help us overcome these kind of technical difficulties. But we still have the difficulties uh, with the content, the, the strange uh, places of the Srimad Bhagavatam. There's also another uh, kind of content related difficulty that some devotees come across. And that is that the Srimad Bhagavatam, of course, is written in an age where the, the kind of normal or, or the kind of expected reader is a man. These are texts that are, are written and spoken by men. All of the different speakers I just mentioned, they're all men. And uh, they're mostly speaking to other men. The Srimad Bhagavatam explicitly says that it's intended for everybody. It's not only intended for Brahmin males or something like that. It's intended for everybody. But the default reader is a man. 
So many of the descriptions will be kind of male-centered. I was just speaking with, I think it was Saragrahi, my, my wife, who is in almost every way smarter than I. So, so she brought out the point that uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam speaks about the, the city of nine gates in the story of, of Puranjana. What's the city with nine gates? Sakirati, do you know? When it's the body openings. Mm -hmm. And how many are they? You say nine. Yeah. <laughs> it's wow. not really true if, I mean, it's nine in the male body. Oh. So, so <laughs> the, the text is uh, it's written from the perspective of a guy. Uh, a woman who is, who is breastfeeding, for example, she'll have plenty more than nine gates. But uh, the book is written, kind of taking a man as the granted audience. It's not that it's, it's, it's meant only for men, but it's just the style of writing in uh, all of these kind of texts. And this can be off-putting to modern readers. So we need to kind of overcome this, this, this challenge, thinking that this text seems to be very outdated. It seems to be patriarchal. It's just speaking in a different style. And we need to kind of learn to read when it says, for example, in Prabhupada's translation about the devotee, he will do this, he will, he doesn't, he should, he shouldn't. To understand that this is just the old-fashioned way of saying he or she or he it or he they or she or whatever but bhakti rasa has a she wants to say a comment so please jai hari krishna hari um, not to take away from the point you are making, which is obviously a very good one, but I had also considered about the nine gates and um, the woman's body having an additional one. So I had wondered if the it wasn't actually a gate where um, either souls information comes in or out or whatever it is that's supposed to pass through that gate, if, if it's not considered a gate because whatever passes through the gates doesn't actually pass through the gates that women have as opposed to those who men are women. Yeah, that's also, a, a, thank you. That's, that's an important possibility. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, we, and to, to, to to get kind of the answer to that, we'd have to go to the fourth canto and read the story of Puranjana and see the description of what these gates are supposed to really be. Uh, I know that there, there's something there about death entering the body through these, these gates, uh, but there are other also uh, things. I think there was something about Puranjana going out through the gates to kind of explore the world. But uh, I'm not quite sure how you'd explore the world through some of the gates in, in, in that case. Nevertheless, uh, I'm very happy that you brought this out, Bhaktirasa, because uh, one of the important things I think to realize is that when it comes to the difficult parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam, such as, for example, the difficulty with uh, the milk ocean and all of these uh, uh, cosmological details. An important point to realize is that we can answer these difficulties, we can face these difficulties in different ways. And I think it's useful for us to be uh, open here that you can overcome these difficulties in different ways. And these ways, they may be quite different, but they may all be very valid nevertheless. One way to deal with, for example, this cosmology of the Srimad Bhagavatam is to simply accept that as the absolute truth. This is what the Srimad Bhagavatam says. So this is how it is. 
And if we can't see it, for example, the Mount Meru, this cone formed golden mountain in the middle of the earth. When I look out to the sky in all the different directions, I don't see such a mountain. But that's not because the Bhagavatam is wrong. That's because my eyes are defective. That's one way of taking it. That the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, it represents some knowledge that I don't understand because being a Kali Yuga person, I'm defective. This requires, of course, uh, taking a very humble attitude. The text knows more than I, even when it seems like my, my senses are telling me something else. I bow to the text. I don't need to understand this. The text is right. This is the way Srila Prabhupada, quite often in his purports, take the Srimad Bhagavatam. If the Bhagavatam says that the moon is farther away from the earth than the sun, then it is like that. It's a difficult uh, proposition for many of us because, of course, we deal uh, with people who don't share this kind of Bhagavata cosmology and uh, who will look on us as complete weirdos if we would say something like, I believe that the sun is closer than the moon because it says like that in my holy book. Uh, and it's fine if people think that we're weirdos. If, if somebody thinks that Brigupad is an idiot and a weirdo and a fanatic, uh, that would probably be good for me. It would uh, make me more humble. But it's not good, of course, for the, the, the spreading of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. If we give the impression that Gaudiya Vaishnavas are all fanatics and fundamentalists and they don't they refuse to accept anything else than is what is the literal reading of their books and it will also be quite off-turning to many people they will think that i will never uh, join that religion i will never get deeper into that religion if they teach so strange things like that that has been my experience so yes it's a valid way of understanding the shimad bhagavatam uh, it works for many people, but it may not work for everybody. So what would be the alternatives? One alternative would be to think that all of this is some kind of allegory. It's not meant to be taken literally. It's uh, some kind of uh, symbolism where the moon and the sun stand for something else. They stand for different realizations of the world. Uh, the moon may stand for some kind of uh, mental, perhaps, plane, plane of the mind, the manas. The sun may stand for some kind of pure uh, realization. Uh, or, or the the world of the of the of the eyesight or the, the the seeing, and the world of the seeing in many ways is uh, closer to us than the world of the mind, which is uh, can seem quite quite foreign to people who are are disconnected with their inner self. So that would be what Prabhupada would call speculation. Prabhupada was not very fond of speculation. We've probably all heard these statements like speculation is worse than death. Uh, but uh, sometimes speculation can be useful. Sometimes it can be useful to kind of think of things in new ways to try to see if they can make sense in some way. This thing with the sun and the moon, I just made it up just like that in the moment. I have no idea if it makes any sense at all. But if you think about it like that, you can, you can then try to see, does it actually help me see something in the Bhagavatam or does it just dit distract from the meaning? You'd have to consider then what would be the meaning of the chariot of the sun, the different horses, uh, why is it moving in a particular way? If your understanding just works for one kind of verse, 
then it's simply an ad hoc understanding. It doesn't really fit into the whole text. But if it makes you understand like a whole thing in a better way, then perhaps it could be useful, even if it's speculation. And in fact, this kind of speculation is not necessarily the same uh, as what we often generally think about speculation. Guru Maharaj sometimes calls this uh, scriptural reasoning, using your reason, using your intellect. And we all have plenty of intellect to try to understand uh, sacred texts in ways that are relevant to today's world. It's not the same as the first, where we simply accept the text as it is, but still it's a way of interacting with the text and trying to penetrate the text and get deep into the text. And it can actually be very uh, functional and very good in the way that it will force us to engage with the text in a way that simply accepting the literal meaning of the text may not do. We'll have to think carefully about these things, the sun and the moon and the, the planets and so on. Another way of dealing with different difficulties, difficult parts of the text, is to, so to speak, shelf them. Here we have something difficult. Here is something about, uh, in the ninth canto, we've been reading about these, these persons who go through these uh, bodily changes, like a, a man becoming a woman or a, a man becoming a woman and then becoming back to a man body and being one month a man, one month, month a woman, or kings who have a million wives and this kind of like outlandish and kind of fairy tale elements or that seem like outlandish and fairy tale. Uh, one way to deal with them is to think, to say to oneself, I don't understand this. I have no idea what this means. But that's fine. I'm little Brigupad Das. I don't understand everything. I understand hardly anything. I don't even understand what my own wife is saying. So how can I expect to understand some ancient scripture? So I'll just put this to the side and I'll get back to it later. I understand already some things of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So I'll focus on these, then these strange things, I'll put them on the side, I'll get back to them later. Uh, it may seem like a kind of cheating and, and a easy way out. It's not always an easy way out. Sometimes it can take a lot of effort to suspend judgment. We're all very eager to judge all kinds of things. I like this. I hate that. I love this person. That person I really dislike. So to suspend this kind of judgment and just realize, I don't understand. That can take quite a lot of bravery, quite a lot of, of integrity. Another way of approaching difficult uh, passages like this is to focus on the meaning what is the Srimad Bhagavatam trying to say here? This one king has a million wives. What's the point? Chitraket, he has a million wives. And he doesn't manage to get uh, any of them pregnant. In a modern text, you'd think, maybe the problem is not so much with the wives, could also be perhaps that the problem is with him, but in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that issue is, is not raised. So what's the point of all of this? The point, of course, can be many things. It can be that sometimes uh, we simply have to accept things. Chitra Ketu, he marries more and more women in order to be able to get a child. Uh, finally he gets a child and the child dies. So sometimes the text is telling us, sometimes we simply have to accept our destiny. Not all things work out. We won't, don't need to 
marry one million women to realize that perhaps I'm not going to get a child. Sometimes the point of a text or a, or a, of a passage in the Srimad Bhagavatam can be quite simple compared to all the details. But to understand the point, of course, we need to read the whole story, not just focus on the million wives, but read the story from the beginning to end. What is the Srimad Bhagavatam actually trying to say here? Personally, I find this way of dealing with the difficult parts perhaps the most uh, um, fulfilling one to constantly go back to why. And the reason why I find this uh, so fulfilling is that the Srimad Bhagavatam always has a why. Like uh, with the cosmology. Do you remember, Shamananda, what does Guru Maharaj say about the cosmology of the Srimad Bhagavatam? What is the point of the cosmology? Uh, not sure. I remember him saying that that was simply how it was viewed at the time by the scientists, like that time's scientists. So that's just the framework they used. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's that's totally correct. And and also that it's uh, it's all the three gunas and and it's impossible to grasp fully. Yes, Those are, I remember Guru Maharaj saying. Yes. He said those things, and he's also said that the point is also to illustrate Vishnu Maya, the wonderful nature of Vishnu Maya. Guru Maharaj sometimes tells the story of how he was with Srila Prabhupada in New York, and uh, Prabhupada asked him, have you seen the women of New York? Have you heard him tell this story? And Guru Maharaj is like, uh, uh, he doesn't. Is, is it like his propa testing him? Should he say no? I'm a sannyasi. I never look at in the direction of a woman. And then propa said, "They are so beautiful. Just see the power of Krishna." So similarly, uh, when the Srimad Bhagavatam describes the wonderful nature of this world. Uh, it's something like a documentary movie. We've all seen these like beautiful documentary movies of whales jumping and eagles soaring and ancient trees and unspoiled wilderness and beautiful cities and all kind of like the beauties of this world. And all of this comes from God. So it's simply another way of doing the same thing. All of this wonderful creation comes from Krishna. And it's one, sim, one little spark of his splendor, like Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. All of these vibhutis, all of these wonders of this world, Indra, Om, all of these different things that he's been describing, he says, know that these are all just one fraction of my splendor. So this wonderful description of the universe, which really is fascinating when you get into all of the details and you try to figure out how does it work, the speeds of the sun, and how, does, how is it possible that the sun turns in one way and the stars going a different way. When you put your mind into this, you realize this is such a wonderful place. How much more wonderful must Krishna be if he has been able to create something like this? And he doesn't even do it himself. He's simply delegating this to Brahma. So how wonderful must be Krishna? That's one of the points. And I'm sure there are many, many other points that, that uh, uh, for example, Bhakti Rasa could bring out for us. So, so focusing on what's the point of a story can be quite helpful, or what's the point of a description when we're getting kind of lost in the details. Uh, I told you I wouldn't be speaking for long today and I've almost gone on for an hour already. I'm, I'm sorry for this. I, I became a little bit inspired by mistake. Uh, any questions or comments?
Hare Krishna. Thank you for the wonderful class. Um, I was wondering, you know, there's so many Sanskrit words and terminology. Do you recommend a Sanskrit dictionary um, that would be helpful you know, in going through, you know, literatures? And because sometimes I find if I Google um, a Sanskrit word, it's not always really clear um, what the meaning is, because there could be multiple meanings as well, depending on you know, who's interpreting and, and that too. So I was just wondering um, if you had a suggestion. Thank you, that's a very good question. Uh, simple answer is no, I wouldn't recommend that for the simple reason that most Sanskrit dictionaries will give so many different synonyms. And for example, the most famous Sanskrit dictionary is that of, of Sir Monia Monia Williams, who was a professor in, in Oxford. It's a huge book, this kind of, uh, like uh, brick. Uh, and most words will have so many different meanings there, and they're not even organized in a way that will be uh, easy for a, a reader to understand which one is the most important one. But Sargrahi has a suggestion here that I know. She, she uses a, a web page, which is often, she has said, has been very helpful. So can you share that with, with us, Sargrahi? I don't remember the name of the page, but Shamananda remembers. Does Shamananda remember? I do and I don't. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, it's like I, I can see it in front of me, but I. Um... Let's see. I put it in the chat in the chat already. Ah, you found it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wisdom and, Library. Yeah, wisdom.org. Yeah. And there so are like some categories, there are categories like what's the word is understood by Buddhist, Hindus, Jain, Jainims, and also Shakti, uh, Shakta people, so, and Vaishnava. So it's, and it's like meaning uh, in Hindi as, in Hindi as well sometimes. So it's, yeah, but I'm usually going for the Vaishnava, but and Ayurveda there is there. But it's all also fun sometimes to check same word what it means in Ayurveda and then have some fun to memorize it. Like I remember I was checking perhaps it was the one of the flute of the Krishna. I think maybe it was it was Vamshi. And in Ayurveda, the same word is for the when you look at the light coming through the window and there is for example through the window and there are these particles of dust floating in it and that's also vamshi so you can kind of think about krishna's flute when you're looking at this kind of flying dust in this sunrise so for example so it's, it's fun with, on this page and there are also they include puranic encyclopedia and glossaries from many books and vaishnava books as well like brihat bhagavatamrita and yeah some other books Oh, thank you very much. That I've seen that before. So, and I've, I've used it a few times. So, I'll um, you know kind of focus on that and and see. So, thank you very much. Um, I was also thinking too about how association is so important when um, reading the Bhagavatam. And um, I have a friend that I've been going through the Bhagavatam with for a few years now, and you know, just the repetitive, I mean, that was part of Srila Prabhupada's program was to read the Bhagavatam every morning. And then once you get to the end of it, to do it again. So that familiarity, you know, with the names and with the, with the stories and the pastimes, just, you know, you get, hopefully get to a point where you're, everything's coming together because it is, you know, it's, um, it's such, there's so many levels uh, in the Bhagavatam. And, and my hope is that each time we're going through it, it's going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, but yeah, so many good points. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Saragrahi and Shivananda for, for helping me. 
Uh, there was something in the chat as well in Spanish. Maybe somebody could could translate, or maybe, yeah, maybe it's not a question. We are from Govinda Mohini. Yes, we can hear you. Brigo, you have to go to the English channel in order to hear Kali Yuga. Aha, uh -huh, okay. He said that he will read first in Spanish and then he will translate to you. Okay. And uh, maybe you can repeat the question so the people on YouTube can hear that too, because they can't hear Kali Yuga Pub. Okay, now I'm in the English channel. Thank you very much, Govinda Mohini. She was uh, sharing her appreciation and, and saying that she's going to go back to the first canto. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Then, then I think I've done something good today. Anything else? In that case, I'd like to, again, thank you all for your time. Thank you for sharing your valuable time with me. Uh, I hope to see many of you soon in Poland. And all the others, I wish you all the best. And I hope to see you in the Swami Call and, and other online events very soon. Jai Shishi Guru Gauranga Gandharuka Giri Dari Shishi Radha Man Mohan Radha Govinda Radha Kapinata. Radha Dama Radha Samson, the Radha Dama Radha Gokun, and the Radha Mahana Vedotipal Nataigo, she shot a boot, Kiriraki, Jai, Jai Guru Marajki, Jai, Jai Guru Paramparaki, Jai, Jai Panchadatwa, Makshi Go, Hariki, Jai, Jai, she print Daman Damki, Jai, she never did Damki, Jai, she brush of Tam Jagana, Puridamki, Jai, Jai Bakhtar in the key, Jai, Jai and the Godavaishan of Rin the key, Jai, Jai. Bhuvan Mangal Hari Nam Sankirtan Ki Jai Jai Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bo. Oh. Hey. Shri Prabhu Ki Jai. Jai.